All right, there we go. So we start in, in uh, Mark 1, 21, and we continue from last week. And uh, Doug, if you would read verse 21, just 21, please. Okay. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. All right. So Capernaum is kind of a neat place. Um it is, let me get a picture here, located on the north-northwest portion of the Sea of Galilee. And so there's a, can you see the picture of it there? It's beautiful. Yeah, oh, it's gorgeous. It's a beautiful place. Um, and I guess you know, it's, I'm sure the parking lot wasn't there <laughs> in the day uh, when Jesus was there. But uh, I wonder if... <laughs> Can, can you can you see my mouse moving? Yes, and there's a cat chasing it. Uh, there we go. Uh, so this is the synagogue right here. Uh, now it is built over where the synagogue was that Jesus knew, and the original synagogue was made of black basalt. And so it was, uh, I guess, deteriorated pretty quick. Um, and in the fourth century, it was rebuilt, and they used uh, white, imported white limestone. And so it's really a pretty place. Now, if you look up here, see this round building there? Mm -hmm. uh, that is where, that's built over or on where uh, Peter's house was. And so this is a nice little museum type facility and we were able to go into it and underneath it is like it's like an overhang so it's a nice picnic area down below so it's it's really nice who knows what peter's house looked like but they say that's where peter was so he was super close to the synagogue he was right there we'll take a look at what the synagogue looks like today and so it's in ruins, but it's really kind of a neat Roman-looking uh, ruin. Architecture, too. Architecture, yeah. So uh, really a pretty place. When we <laughs> visited there, it was like, looks like this day, it was, uh, it was raining, but it was totally overcast. So I didn't get very many good pictures there. I didn't get any good pictures. But uh, really a neat place. It's kind of neat to walk where you know jesus walked that was that's kind of cool even though it's it very cool even though you know it's different stone and stuff but still same place um so uh the question is and let me see if i can pull this up and i'll let you guys what existed in the old testament the temple synagogues or both of them? In the Old Testament only? In the Old Testament only. It was just a synagogue, wasn't it? In the Old Testament? I said yeah. both. Okay. Well. Well. Uh, it, it would was, have been. It was. It was actually just the temple in the Old Testament. Really. Let me tell you a story. <laughs> Gather around. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there were no synagogues in the Old Testament, and I wouldn't have known this if had I not studied this this week. So it's kind of neat. Uh, it only mentions the temple in the Old Testament in 586 BC. The Babylonians took the Jews captive and destroyed their temple. So took them all away and destroyed the temple. There's no place to do anything in, no place for sacrifice, no nothing. So they decided where they were taken. I think they were taken to Babylon. And uh, they decided to uh, do something called uh, Suna Goge. Suna Goge which means to, go, to gather together, yes. which is synagogue. Together bring. Yeah, bring that's right. And so they couldn't sacrifice, but they could discuss the written law. 
And as they discussed the, the written law, they developed the oral law. We've all heard of the oral law. And it's 600 and, somebody help me out, 663, 13. huh? 13? That sounds right. 613 um, oral laws that, that really defined what the Pharisees got all upset about most of the time. Um, by the time they got out of captivity, which I didn't look that up, how many years were they in captivity? Was it 70? Don't hold me to that. I want to say it was 70. By the time they got out of uh, captivity, it was just an accepted form of, of gathering and, and a place to come together and talk about the oral law. So the institution rena- remained and is an institution to today. So interesting, wow. huh? Aren't that you just blown away by those words? I am. Uh, you know, I knew there was going to be homework, but you just kind of, uh, <laughs> you, you whipped it on a stug. I'm yeah. telling you, I wasn't you prepared for this. I had a few notes, but you went far. Uh, it's I, I, I kind of, I looked up the, the Greek, the root to it and, you know, but I didn't look to see if it actually existed in the Old Testament or anything. All right. All right. But wait, there's more. Free shipping. I, I knew you'd like that. <laughs> um, so the, the, the synagogue has a certain structure. Certain people do certain things. And so you have a, a person called a Hazan which uh, a lot of times our good friend Doug has performed this these uh, functions. They keep the scrolls, and the, there was a wooden ark, and they trim the lamps, and they sweep the floors, make sure it's ready for, for worship, ready for gathering. Then there was a ruler of the synagogue, and that guy would plan the service, and when there was a rabbi or a scribe in the area, then they would arrange for that person to actually speak, to actually read the scripture and all that kind of stuff. Uh, now, Jesus used that guy to get into all of the synagogues throughout the Sea of Galilee area where he was uh, going on to teach. Uh, later, Paul would use his pharisaical status uh, to speak at synagogues. Then there were the elders. There's a place for the elders up front of the synagogue uh, where they would sit, and they were called the principled men. There was an attendant of the congregation, uh, and this is the one who would read the Torah and provide the explanation. And this is what, this is the role that Jesus would take when he would come around and talk to the synagogues. Then they'd have an interpreter. And you think, why do they need an interpreter? For well, the congregation, the people probably spoke uh, the language of the Babylonian captivity, which was uh, Chaldean or Aramaic. So the interpreter would, would interpret the Hebrew being spoken by the attendant who was reading the Hebrew Torah. So there was an interpreter, I guess, if needed. And then finally, there were almoners, and there were two or three people that were responsible to collect money and help the poor in the city. And so that's basically our benevolence ministry. So uh, you guys are getting your two cents worth tonight, aren't you? I think that's closer to a quarter, I think. <laughs> so uh, I, don't know, I just thought that was interesting. I'm not, I'm not sure how you can bring that up in a gospel oriented um sharing situation but hey you never know well Rich, you know, can, that everybody there fully understood what they were preaching okay so if someone is there and, and doesn't understand the language mm-hmm. that's a no-no right well it, it, i guess they made accommodation for them though since yeah. they had the interpreter so right i mean that's it was yeah. important to them very absolutely. structured absolutely yeah all right, Rich, verse 22, uh, Mr. Kevin, you are next to my right, if you would read verse 22. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority, 
and not as the scribes. All right, we see this kind of concept in a few places. I know that it, it comes up in uh, Matthew 5, I believe, um, and probably a few other places where he taught with authority and not as the teachers of the law. Um, so the teachers of the law, according to several commentators, um, Mike Winger, uh, R.C. Sproul, um, said that the, the scribes would, would teach by quoting other scribes or authorities, other rabbis. And uh, Jesus, and so in other words, they'd say, well, this scripture, according to so-and-so, meant this, and this other guy meant this. And so there was nothing real definite, kind of like we do now. We look at other um, other uh, uh, very intelligent people who we respect, and uh, we think, well, they, they said that that probably means this. But Jesus taught with authority. There was no question, and the people noticed that he taught with authority. This is what this scripture means, and oh, by the way, uh, and that one time he said, and it's been fulfilled in your ears right now. So uh, he taught with absolute authority. It was all about him. That was Matthew 7, 28, and 29. 7, 28. So part of the um, uh, uh, Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Good. Thank you. All right. 23. This is a big one. Uh, 23 through 26. And Andrew, you are next, sir. All right. Just then, a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this, a new teaching? And with authority, he even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. All right. And about that time, I'm heading out the door. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to set this one outside a little bit here. Yeah. I'll tell you what, and it must have been really common because he heals. It mentions he heals later on. He heals a lot of people of, uh, or exercises a lot of demons. And so it must have been very common. Maybe it's common today. We just don't notice it. Uh, well, could you imagine sitting there and watching that all come down? Oh, yeah. like going, uh, yeah, this is um, this guy's special. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and yet, you see at the end there where they um, they were all amazed and they questioned among themselves. In other words, they debated. Now, what's to debate? You you just saw a guy exercise a demon and the demon followed instructions and left and he's teaching with authority well what's not to believe and called him and knew who he was yeah holy one of god yeah knew exactly who he was it does tell us a few things about uh demons and we don't get a lot of information about demons but only that they exist but it um it told us, it tells us that they're limited geographically. Otherwise, he would have known that Jesus was there. He was obviously surprised and would not have been at that service or at that, uh, at that, at that teaching in the synagogue. He wouldn't have wanted to have been there at all. So they're geograph geographically limited. They're, they're not omniscient, omnipresent, anything like that. Um. They do know Jesus without a doubt. They recognize him, like you said, Kevin. And they seem to know what's coming, but they don't seem to know when it's coming. I when agree. They're, when they're doomed. Huh? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so they're very limited creatures, but um, uh, spiritual and able to possess someone. Now, uh, I think it might have been Skip Reitzig or Mike Winger. I can't remember. 
one of them said that it's impossible for a believer to be possessed uh, because we have only room for, um, I guess, one type of possessor. So Jesus followers, uh, Christians, are Jesus-possessed, if you will. We are indwelt. There's the word. Uh, we are indwelt by by Christ. And so we can't be indwelt by anything else. We can get wayward and um, and sin, but we can't be indwelt by uh, by a demon. And so it would it would be logical then that if the demons do not know when the end, they know how it's going to end. Right. So that Satan also. Yes. Uh, does not know when. Same situation. Yep. Right. Absolutely. Um, it's really interesting too. You know, we we have seen we've all seen these guys on TV. They're exercising demons or whatever they're doing, and uh, there's big theatrics. You know, yelling and screaming and and. Um, um, calling things down and yelling and whatnot. And Jesus did it with the utmost untheatric situation, uh, untheatric actions. He basically said, shut up and get out. And that was it. Shut up and get out. So um, then, like you said, the people noticed, hey, this is different and started to debate and talk about it, and then obviously started to spread the word. So, uh, Dad, you get a short one. Uh, 28, if you would read verse 28, please, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Oh, I thought I was going to get out of this. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Okay, did you say verse 28? Yes, sir. And immediately his fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee. All right, so the people, they might have been debating it, but they were spreading the word. And this was the original so social media network. I mean, they were beating feet. Can you believe? Da, 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 da. So um, they got quite serious about telling people about that. All right, 29 through 31. Um, yeah, I'll take one. Uh, and immediately he left the synagogue. Notice immediately. There's another immediately. Just now, immediately. All Amazos. That. Yeah, Amazos. Amazos. <laughs> <laughs> and immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew. Now, we know that was just hardly down the road. That was a few feet away. And James and John uh, uh, entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now, Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever and immediately told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. And the fever left her, and she began to serve them. Uh, neat story. I, you guys, uh, I've talked about The Chosen, and this is a great scene in The Chosen. If you haven't seen it, I'm going to send it to you in um, in text on GroupMe and uh, and in text then. And it's just a great little scene uh, where his mother-in-law is, is raised up and and she goes to work. <laughs> it's like a Jewish mother. It's <laughs> really neat, a neat scene. So I'll leave that with you. Uh, but why did the people, I should have put another poll here, why did the people wait until sundown and to come to Peter's house? It marks the end of the Sabbath. The end of the Sabbath, that's right. So a lot of them couldn't go anywhere. They couldn't walk that far, you know, whatever the situation was. Didn't want to force Jesus to work on the Sabbath, whatever. So that was... 
probably the reason. Most likely. You're right, Doug. Um, My book says that. That's what your book said, huh? Uh, you do that anyway. <laughs> um, 34. Uh, oh, actually, we haven't seen We haven't read those yet. We haven't read 32 to 34 yet, have we? Nope. Oh, okay. Sorry. Doug, read 32 to 34. 32 to 34. Okay. Nope. That evening at sundown. They brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by the demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. All right. So waited till sundown to wait to the end of the Sabbath so that there could be some real work going on. And notice that he continued to shush the demons. Obviously, they all wanted to talk when they were coming out. So, uh, But he put those down quickly. Why do you think that um, he shushed them and wouldn't let them continue to verify his existence, his work? Was it time? Yeah, I think you're right. I think it, it just timing is everything, and it wasn't time. Yeah, you, you want to get that steam roller to rolling, but you don't want it going 20 miles an hour yet. So yeah, when you start throwing Chuck and demons out, you pretty much gaslit it. It's it's pretty much that yeah. thing's on autopilot. You're you're ready to go. That yeah. that's just amazing. And you just say, hey, don't don't even talk to me. Just get yeah. and. Yeah, absolutely. It's amazing. Well, it also says that um, by doing that, he was also extending, uh, substantiating the authority that had been given to him by his heavenly father. By making them hush? Yes. Okay. Showing complete authority over him. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I can see that. Yep. All right, 35, Kevin. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. All right, we see Jesus doing this pretty often, getting off to himself and praying. Um, so Jesus sacrificed, sacrificed sleep to be with his father. Charles Spurgeon said, uh, look no man in the face till thou, and pardon my speech, till thou hast seen the face of God. Speak thou with none till thou hast had speech with the Most High. Probably a good, good policy. Probably a good policy. All right, Andrew, 36 through like 39. Can you scroll down a little, Rich? I'm, yeah, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm on a couple of different screens here. There we go. Thank you, Rich. Yeah, anytime. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Andrew, 36 to 39. All right. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I've come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. All right. So in 37, it seems like everyone was looking for Jesus. So why do you think everyone was looking for Jesus? Well, they... They just wanted to be around him. This guy's performing miracles. He's doing, I mean, it's, why wouldn't you? Yeah. I mean, they're bringing sick people to him. This is getting around. Yeah. And they have sick people. You have demon-possessed people. And you have people just saying, we've never, we've never heard anybody like this. Yeah. You know, and, and going back earlier, he speaks with authority, unlike anybody we've ever heard. Mm-hmm. So 
why do you think they wanted to be around you? Yeah. Well, I think you're right. Why, why wouldn't they? But one of their main pushes probably was more healings in, in, in because that's an impressive thing. So the question becomes, you know, he's already said, oh, we're going to more towns because I've got to preach. So what, what does this tell us? He said he did the healings and he did the preaching, but he tells us in 38 that the preaching is why he came. Right. So it's it's the priority. Yes. But the people at the moment, yeah, that preaching's pretty cool, but man, he's doing healings, you know. Right. So the question becomes, and I think I've already answered it, but why didn't he just stay there in Capernaum and heal everybody? And then move on. This, he is setting the groundwork. He's going to each one of these vi- these little villages, these towns. Yeah. And every time he does that, it just grows and it grows and it grows. And after a few towns, you can't stop it. Yeah. But he was he was also sent out to preach the gospel by his father, wasn't? He? Yeah. Yeah. That was that was one of the, the his father's. Okay. Uh, want correct i mean that that's why i have come that's what he said that and, and at the end of 38 for that is why i came out so yeah. preaching was the deal the healings were just to to get the attention and to verify hey what i'm saying is real what i'm saying has authority and i'm going to heal it's but it's to gain the attention of the to the preaching for the preaching right. it's to verify the preaching and so uh even today we're not going to see healings all the time paul wasn't even healed of whatever affliction he had uh we're going to see some especially it seems like i've got no data on this but it seems like you see more and he'll hear more healings about in places where the gospel is not where the gospel needs to be and so the Lord's still using healings to gain attention to the gospel. And the and the disciples were, the apostles were allowed, once Christ left and they were anointed with the Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. they even at time to time had, not I don't think in great, but time to time had that authority also. They sure did. They? they sure did. Yeah. They continued. The apostles certainly, certainly did. And the people were watching the uh, the process of demons being cast out, and that was something totally new to them. Mm-hmm. So it's highly possible that there was uh, an entertainment value in that, also. You bet. Yeah, and and we see guys try to capitalize on that today on TV. And, yeah. Um, but now, you know, we, we always have medical terms, but think about this. Back then in the beginning, they knew it was demons. Mm. Yeah. We, you don't hear that here, do you? Yeah. Hardly never. You never hear it. Right. But back then, that's what it was. Yeah. Has that changed, you think? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know. We were in India making a presentation. Um and there was just a group of people, and it was probably 100 people that we were talking to. And uh, everybody was sitting on the ground. We were on kind of a stage thing. And somebody stood up in the middle of it and just started screaming stuff. I didn't understand what they were saying. They were speaking Hindi. But uh, somebody shuffled them along and got them, got them down the road so that nobody could hear them type of thing. But uh, was it That's been passion? Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. It's but, been see, just crazy. And the other thing you have to remember, too, is back then they didn't have all the medical diagnosis that they have today. Right. So, I mean, even like back in the day, say Andrew or Christine trying to teach kids in a classroom. Mm-hmm. Okay. And you have these kids that are ADHD and o- or ADD. Okay. A lot of people back then probably would have considered them to be with demons. Maybe because they couldn't get them to settle down or pay attention or anything else. Maybe, maybe. 
But obviously those that yep. Jesus dealt with, if he's if they're shaking them violently, wanting to talk on the way out, they were demons. <laughs> and Jesus yep, recognized that's right, that's right. the real the right. real situation, obviously. Yeah. Um right. so yeah, it, it's good questions we won't be able to answer on this side of the Jordan. You know what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Most likely. <laughs> <laughs> So. I like the way you phrased that. <laughs> <laughs> Sign of the Jordan. <laughs> All right. Uh, Andrew, 40 through 44, please, sir. All right. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees. If you're willing, you can make me clean. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. Immediately, the leprosy left him, and he was cured. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded you are commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. All right. So this one appears different. This, this healing appears different. It's mentioned separately. Um, it's mentioned after Jesus uh, had left. We don't know if he's in another town or not, but he's somewhere else, and this guy approaches him. And uh, there are some characteristics that are kind of interesting about this guy. Number one, he's sincere. He's reverently kneeling before the Lord. Uh, so he's humble, and he says, if you will, uh, he's believing. He he says, "You can, you know, if you want to, you can do this." Uh, he acknowledges his need. He says, he, "He make me clean." In other words, I'm dirty. Please make me clean. He's very specific in what he said. Make me clean, and it's personal. Make me clean, and it's brief. He's not this big long, exp- uh, big long preachy. You blah 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 blah. He's pretty much straight, straight to the point. Uh, so if we pray uh, in regard to somebody's healing, um, and if we say something to the effect that, that you're, you're very capable, Lord, if you decide and if you so will, we ask that you would heal so-and-so. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, what's really neat in what Jesus did is that there's no telling how long this guy had leprosy. And so when they had leprosy, they were shunned. They, they couldn't be around anybody. And um, so certainly nobody could touch them. I, I heard one guy said that some uh, rabbis would, would see a leper and actually throw rocks just to make sure that they wouldn't come close. Um, but what did Jesus do? Not only did he heal him, but he could have stood, stood off to the at a quarter mile and said, "Okay, you're healed." And it sure it would have worked. But what did he do? He touched, he touched him. Touched him. Can you imagine what that meant to that guy? This person actually, this rabbi, this holy rabbi actually touched me and healed me. Uh, so then he tells him to. Uh, Go to the priest. Why? Do we know? To make the sacrifice. Make the sacrifice. After. Sir? I was going to say after. Um, trying to find where it is, but it's going to take me a little while. But after you're around someone with leprosy, mm-hmm. there was that. A prescribed amount of days in the sacrifice or something. And yeah, you're you're so right on target. You're right on target. It's Le- Leviticus 14. There you go. And it lays out a couple of a uh, couple of, of uh, paragraphs there, pretty detailed. And uh, then it goes into well, if they're too poor to give this sacrifice, then they can they can do this. And there's a time waiting period and uh, come back and do this. And then you're clean and it takes a while. So it was at least eight days, kind of like you said. And um, 
So it's really neat. And what's, you know, I hadn't noticed this before, but uh, Gusick brought out that what this really did was send a message. You know, he, this guy's going to, is healed. He's going to go to the priest and the, he's, the priest is going to be like, well, yeah, I saw that you were, you had leprosy for the last 25 years and it's gone now. Now they have to go because it had never been done since um, Naaman the Syrian was healed by Elisha. So this process had never been accomplished. So the priests, they knew, Jesus knew, they were going to have to go back to Leviticus and reread this and start through this process and recognize that something's different. Something's going on. This has not been done. And oh, okay. I wonder if the Messiah is here, you know. So that he was that was a calling card to the priest. Hey, something's oh, okay. going, something's that going on. Pretty neat. He had to go bear witness. He had to go bear witness. So um, he, he, the Lord set this one up big time and um, made sure that the message was going to be clear. Now, he also says, see that you don't say anything. So can you imagine being healed after 25 years and not saying anything? The family going, hey, you're all clean. Well, <laughs> You're not going to go, yeah, it's nothing. <laughs> you know? um, hard to hold that in. Hard to hold that in, and the Lord had to know it. But it it brought about a tough situation here. That Dad, would you read uh, 45? We'll finish up the chapter. <clears throat> but he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town but was out in desolate places and people were coming to him from every quarter. Yep. Yep. So, and, and again, I'm not sure where this event took place, but again, it's probably likely not in Capernaum. Um, And the significance, again, is probably because it hadn't been done since the Lord was moving through Elisha. So those are the big takeaways uh, in that regard. And, but from then on, he had to stay out of the towns and just uh, preach kind of remotely, I guess. Uh, unless he, well, later it says, I think he went into synagogue. So he had to slip in and slip out pretty quick, probably. Most of those situations. So. There is Mark 1. What do you think? Comments, questions, rebuttals?